Spanish, the University of Montana Paleontology Collection since 2008. In 2017, she became a host and a content consultant for PBS Eons, a YouTube channel dedicated to the history of life on Earth. Kelly's debut book, Tales of the Prehistoric World, was released in the fall of 2022. Now, before you leave today, I want to tell you about next year's program. Could you use the microphone, pretty please? Thank you. No, I don't want to. <laughs> now, no? Hold on. There? Yeah. There. Okay. Um, maybe I'll just do this real quick. Go ahead. Then everybody can escape. <laughs> um, we have about half of our program set. Leif Eric Fredrickson is going to talk about the Mullen Road in July. Um, Ken Egan is going to be talking about Montana 1864 in November. A gentleman named Bruce Mahelich is going to be talking about Ponies and Passes, which is a program about the importance of the ponies in, and taking the passes to the West Coast during Lewis and Clark's trip. Um, Larry Milichek is going to come and talk about a Doolittle Raider. And Lee Silliman is going to be doing um, the history of the grizzly bear. And Martha Cole, I don't know what month yet, is going to be talking about her book, The School Worms. So that'll be fun too. And I'm trying to get an Indian trade routes program lined up for us, which I think would be fascinating. So that's for it. Go for it, Kelly. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right. What year are you retiring? Not. <laughs> there you go. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Great. All right, so this is going to be a little bit different talk than what you guys normally get into because we're going way back in history. Um, so this is going to be a very quick history of life on Earth, and we've got a lot to get through, so let's jump in. I'm going to start out by talking about the geologic time scale because that's really, I'm going to use a lot of terms from the geologic time scale today, and so I want to introduce it to you if you are unfamiliar with it. Then we'll go into the Precambrian, which takes place over the first 4 billion years of our planet's history. So 4.5 to 3, uh, 538 million. So the GA means billions of years ago, the MA millions of years ago, and then we'll get into some KAs later, thousands of years ago. Then the Paleozoic, 538 million to 252 million, the Mesozoic, 252 to 66 million, and then the Cenozoic, which we are in presently, started 66 million years ago, and then we'll move in. Yes? In that context, how do geologists come up with these different names just when they start and end? Let's get right into that. All right, so let's talk about the geologic time scale. So this is the pro version of the geologic time scale. This is what I use daily to make sure that huh, I'm where I need to be um, in Earth history. And we get this uh, based on all sorts of stuff, based on radiometric dating of rocks. Um, the names that you see are all proposed by researchers, usually based on the place where that rock layer that we defined the unit was found. Um, let me see if I can figure out a good uh, example here. I can't. Anyways, okay, so, but the main thing is to know that it starts with the formation of the Earth and it goes all the way to the present. So it goes oldest to youngest that way. All of these little yellow spikes are golden railroad spikes and those denote the type section. So the place that the researchers were working and they dated them and they were like, I think this is the boundary between the Cambrian and Ordovician and it's dated to 485.4 million years. And the section that they worked on, once that name is approved by the International Chronostratigraphic, or actually International Commission on Stratigraphy, they approve it. They drive, they literally physically go out and drive a golden spike into that unit and it marks that boundary. So everywhere that you see a little golden spike, there's an actual physical golden spike somewhere in the world that denotes those units. Now this is a living document. You'll see up at the top here, this is 2023-4. So this is already the fourth version of this chart. 
since the beginning of the year. So as we get better techniques on dating, some of these sites are redated. So one very familiar one that you guys might know about is the KT boundary. So the Cretaceous tertiary boundary that's now known as the KPG. Well, when I was growing up, that was 65 million years ago. That boundary, 65 million. Well, we've redated those units uh, using newer techniques and it turns out, no, it's a little farther back. It's actually 66 million years. So that boundary is right here. And it's 66.0 right on the button. Um, but like I said, if you looked at older versions of this geologic time scale from maybe 2008, um, there would still be this big bar that said tertiary instead of paleogene and neogene, um, and it would be 65. So as we learn more, we update this constantly. So every three months or so, I double check to make sure that I am using the most up-to-date. Can you put your finger on Glacial Lake Missoula? I cannot, it's too small. So Glacial Lake Missoula would be right up here in recent the recent late. Event. A recent event. What do you mean? A recent event, geologically. It is in the Pleistocene. So that's why it's hard to put my finger on it because it's so recent that brackets of time get so close together. So you can see this bracket right here, this is 12,000.9 and the next one is 11,000.7. But if we jump back here a little bit farther, this one goes from 5.567 billion to 2.5 billion in just this little jump here. So this is not scaled perfectly, but yes, the more recent stuff would be at the top. We are sitting on top, and I think this next image will help a little bit. So this is more casual geologic time scale, and it's done by a really famous artist called Ray Troll, and so this is kind of looking at the west coast, if you will. And you can see here are our main um, breakdowns of the geologic time scale that I'm going to be using today. So we'll go through the Precambrian, Cambrian, Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian, Carboniferous, Permian, Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and then I'm going to bound everything by Paleogene, Neogene, and Quaternary for time. Uh, so we, you can see even how life has changed over this, but this is a little bit more simple, fun uh, version of the one that I use every day. So let's get into the Precambrian. So we can't have life without Earth yet. So we gotta talk about the Earth formation. So Earth formed about 4.5 billion years ago. And we know this age based on dating meteorites, both here and on the moon. But we have one little tiny piece of rock and it's called a zircon. It's a crystal. And these are amazing timekeepers and they're almost indestructible. And so we have zapped this thing with lasers because we're scientists and you got to shoot stuff with lasers all the time. And when we do that, we get dates of about 4.4 billion. So what that means is this had to have crystallized from magma. This is a crystal of a mineral. And so it had to cool enough. The surface had to cool enough to form a crystal. So we think about 4 billion years, 100 million years after the Earth formed, we already had a solid lid. And the other cool thing about some of these uh, zircons is that they show evidence of water already. So a lot of researchers think as soon as we had that solid lid, we had water oceans. But this is not like any ocean that we think about today. Earth was a weird place four billion years ago. So here's a little picture of what we think Earth might have looked like if we were hanging out in a spaceship outside of Earth about three billion years ago. That's probably what it looked like. And what you're seeing is these orange shapes that would have been land masses. We're not 100% sure where they were, where they were situated, so this is all hypothetical. But we think that they would have looked orange. They would have reflected orange back due to all the magnesium rich continental rock that you see there. But the oceans are green, they're not blue. And the reason why our oceans would be green is because there was a whole bunch of iron in our oceans. We have a ton of oxygen, we're breathing it right now. 21% is a lot of oxygen actually. And it reacts with so much stuff. So at this time, we didn't have any at, like atmospheric or oceanic a, uh, oxygen, nothing. We would not survive very long. The other thing, ooh, let's see, 
where is that? Note, I have a really fun note. Yes, here it is, here it is. So as soon as we got this liquid, this water, right? It was, a, it was superheated. So the atmospheric pressure on our planet was 215 times what it is now. That would be like the weight of all the world's oceans sitting on you at ground level. And because of that incredibly high pressure, even at surface temperatures of 450 degrees, water wouldn't boil. So this is superheated, high iron water in our oceans at this time. So a very, very strange place. It would have been a, an alien world to us now. Where are all these old rocks, though? So we do have rocks that date back to the very, very first hard rocks that formed from our molten planet. And you can see we got some old ones over here in the Jack Hills. That's where those little zircons are from. But there's one unit up here, the Acosta Nice. It's about 4 billion, 4.3 billion years old, and it is the actual oldest unquestioned isotopically dated rock found so far. So what that means is that they actually took a rock and dated it versus um, finding a little zircon rain, uh, grain in another rock and dating the grain. So we actually dated the rock. So that rock in Northwest uh, Canada has been hanging out on our planet undisturbed basically for 4 billion years. But you can see there's a lot of rock on our planet that has actually hung out for over 4 billion years or around 4 billion years. And this is what it looks like. It's really pretty because it's a metamorphosed rock. So what that means is it has been heated up and it's been squished a little bit, but not totally melted. So think of like a taffy consistency versus like a syrup consistency. So you can see some of these big folds and loops as the rock was kind of squished under high temperatures and pressures. But that's what it looks like. Now, we finally do get some life, and it happens actually really, really fast. So again, uh, Earth did cool off fairly quickly. And because it cooled off, we could get some life. So around four and a half billion years, the surface temperature was about 450 degrees Fahrenheit. By about three billion years ago, we were at about 167 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's still pretty hot. Uh, but by about 420 million years, which we'll get to eventually, we were down to about 95 degrees Fahrenheit. But now we're starting to get some evidence of life. And it always has surprised me how early we start to get evidence of life. Again, our planet formed 4.5 billion years ago. And then by 4.1 billion years ago, again, in one of those little zircon grains, we find evidence of biogenic carbon. Now, life uses a different isotope of carbon. And we can look at the ratios of those two. And if you got more biogenic carbon, if you have biogenic carbon at all, it has to be made by life. It was used by life. We have one grain. So a sample size of one. So that's not the best for science, but it gives us something to work off of. It shows us what could be out there potentially, and we can look for it a little bit closer in more zircon grains. But again, biogenic carbon. There might have been something out there 4.1 billion years ago. Yeah. Is the biogenic carbon created by life? Mm -hmm. So it's the form of carbon. We use carbon 14 instead of 15. 14? Yeah, I think so. Anyways, it's a different, it's the wider version. So life is, likes to be efficient with its time and effort. And so there's less, less effort that needs to go into using a lighter isotope of carbon than the heavier one. And so when you get lots of speaks, uh, spikes of biogenic carbon in your sample, that usually denotes that you've got some life going on. So, but again, that's a sample set of one. So that's, uh, everybody takes that number with a grain of salt, and hopefully we can get some better evidence to either support or disprove the 4.1. Now, once we get to about 3.5, we see these weird little shapes. And there's two camps on these weird little shapes. Some people think that these are microfossils. These, this is something. This is life. And then there's other people that are like, no, 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 no. That is not life. 
This is uh, something that is made in the chert. This is something that happens naturally. It's not made by life. It's not life. So this is pretty controversial. There's a whole bunch of different ones, and there's a lot of papers out there that go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, whether these actually represent fossils or not. But nobody argues the stromatolites at 3.4 billion. So by 3.4 billion, we definitely have life. And life has probably been around a lot longer than 3.4 because at the Straley Pool site in Australia, there are six different types of stromatolites already. So they've probably been around for a while. Now, stromatolites are really important to the history of life on Earth. Here's what they look like today. They're still around. So if you really want to talk about living fossils, this is it. <laughs> this is about as old as you can get. It's still around today. They live in tidal zones. So as the tide comes up and out, some of them are exposed, some of them aren't. And they're cyanobacteria. They're a photosynthesizing microbial mat. So they build these little mats. And as the tide comes in and out, it brings sand grains. And they're sticky. They're gooey, the cyanobacteria is. And so little grains of sediment get stuck in them. But they're also photosynthesizers, so they need light. So as they're building up this little layer of sediment, they grow over the top of it. And they help produce um, and lithify the structure underneath them. So only the tiniest little rimmed surface of this rock, this pedestal, is actually alive. Everything under like the first maybe two millimeters or so is just all of these layers that that microbial mat has built up over time. It's super slow, very, 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 very slow. And today, they can only live in these really hypersaline environments because nothing else can live in them. These guys were mostly taken out by grazers later on, which we're going to get to. So foreshadowing here. Um, but uh, so they live in places where other things can't live, so other things can't eat them. Like snails, gastropods, love the microbial mats. Yeah? How does the word reproduction enter the scenery of this picture? Reproduction? The, we are asexual at this point. So we're... Asexual? Yep. I mean... Um, Non-sexual? Yeah. No, it's not uh, sexual reproduction yet. So they, uh, Rock, one of these things breaks off a piece mm -hmm. that becomes. Yeah, it could become a new colony. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we have not made it to sexual reproduction, but we're going to hit that soon. So, one thing that the stromatolites did, though, which is super important. So, again, oldest stromatolites that we know of about 3.5, 3.4 billion years. By about 2.5 billion years ago, we get an event, and it's called the Great Oxygenation Event. And what happened was the photosynthesizing bacteria had an entire billion years of the planet to themselves. It was everybody loves everybody. There weren't predators, there weren't prey, there were microbial mats photosynthesizing. And they were pumping out oxygen to the tune of 1%. That was a big, it was a big deal. 1% oxygen in our atmosphere about two and a half billion years ago. And what that did was it made enough oxygen to rust all the free iron, the free iron in the rock around you. So there used to be pyrite just like laying in stream beds, as far as the eye can see, fool's gold. Nowadays, it reacts almost immediately to oxygen and breaks down. Same thing with rust and iron. You leave some iron out, it rusts, it reacts with the oxygen. So before, no oxygen, no oxygenation. Then you get 1% of oxygen, and oh my gosh, everything goes crazy, and we get these banded iron formations. They're these rocks, and they're all over the world, and they date to about the same date, and you get these red and black layers. They're absolutely gorgeous, and some of these can actually be stromatolites, which is amazing. They're gorgeous. These are some of my favorite rocks. But they only show up during the great oxygenation event, because once all the free iron had rust, it had all reacted. It's done. It's kaput. Yeah? This rock is on display at the American Museum of Natural History. I don't know where it's from, though. There wasn't like a picture of a label. I was trying to find a public domain image of a banded iron formation, and this is the best. You can age a tree by tree rate, right. age rock. 
We use radiometric dating. So we use uh, radioactive isotopes that decay at known rates into other isotopes. And we compare how much of the parent isotope to the daughter isotope, and that gives us an age. So all of these are radiometrically dated. Most of the time, we don't know a sedimentation rate, how fast rock builds up over time, because it could be uh, overnight in a flash flood, or it could be millennia of tiny little dust grains like loss um, building up over time in a valley. If you, if you make a line between all these horizontal Nope, we have no idea how much time any of that represents. We don't have like the Rosetta key. With a tree, we know it grows annually, but we have no idea how fast, three, two and a half billion years ago, that sediment was being deposited over time. So we would be able to say one, e one inch equals X years. We don't have that kind of resolution in the deep past. It gets a little bit better the closer you get to today. We can do that sometimes with lake, uh, lake layers. If you can cut down into a lake and you get these very, very thin lines called varves, and you can actually see light and dark bands, and you can count those. And that can give you some ages. But you can only do that with stuff today, in this millennium, basically. Not so much back that way. Also, I have no idea how big that rock is. I think it's a pretty giant chunk, though. Um, but we mine these for iron ores now and all sorts of stuff. All right, so now we finally are getting some complex life. So about 1.9 billion years ago, we have evidence of our earliest eukaryotes. And a eukaryote, if you're trying to remember way back to your biology courses, that just means the nucleus is enclosed. It's not just free floating. Things are just crazy in a cell. We've got an enclosed nucleus. And these early eukaryotes were probably single cells, though. There was just one, unicellular. What's fun is Montana actually has some of the oldest ones. These are fossils from the Grayson Formation, which is far, part of the famous belt supergroup here in Montana. And they're anywhere from about 1.4 to 1.7 billion years old. And they are very strange. Um, even being such a high age, they have all these like little tube feet things coming off of them. They are probably the strangest out of all the life that I looked at, um, all the early eukaryotes I looked at trying to find an uh, example of one. Uh, so we finally get a eukaryote about that time. Now, how did we go from single cell to multi-cell or even single cell to an enclosed nucleus? Well, there's a theory out there called the endosymbiotic theory. And it thinks that a long, long time ago, a single cell Pac-Man, basically, another cell. But it didn't digest it. It was like, hey, you, you have a function, and I would like to tap into that function. How about I give you some protection and food, and you give me that protection, or that function. This is way oversimplification of in the endosymbiotic theory. But anyway, so you go from one cell eats or engulfs another cell, and then they become symbiotic. They have a relationship together. They scratch each other's backs. And that relationship develops over billions of years. So our mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, is somebody that we kidnapped about two billion years ago. It has completely different DNA than us. They are aliens in our own body that form huge functions, and we cannot live without them now. But they are a product of the endosymbiotic theory. So we get our earliest eukaryotes. And then, somewhere around 1.6, we get dun -da -da -da, multicellular life. We get more than one cell in the same thing. And this is a little picture. Who are you? These are from uh, Canada, and they're about 1.05 billion years old. And we think they might re be related to red algae. Hmm, they're still kind of working on it. But somewhere between here, 1.6 billion, and here, 800 million, we get sexual reproduction. Somewhere. Somewhere in between these two is where we finally get sexual reproduction. And then by 800 million years ago, we get our first metazoans, our first animals. And they were sponge-like. It's this, this thing here. Uh, it was found in Namibia. Um, and it's about 760 million years old. So a lot has happened 
in the first four billion years of our planet. Now, once we get into about 580 to 540 million years ago, we get into this famous unit of, well, this famous group of animals called the Ediacaran biota. And this is might have what it would look like. Everything squishy here. Everything that you see in this picture is soft body. Also, we really don't know what they are. And we don't really know how they're related to the rest of life that we're going to talk about in just a second. They're very, very strange. A couple of things that we do know. This one, Dickinsonia, is probably an animal. <laughs> So there's two different types of cholesterol out there. There's animal cholesterol, our cholesterol, and then there's plant cholesterol. And so you can, again, shoot lasers at fossils and see what pops back. And what popped back on Dickinsonia, the actual fossil, was animal cholesterol. And when we tested the rock around the fossil, it was plant cholesterol. So we're pretty sure this was an animal. This is one of the first animals that could move on its own. So we have like this fossil here and then like a little squishy imprint and then like a little squishy imprint. So we think that animals started moving during this time. We also start to see predation. Things start to eat other things for the first time in our Earth's history. And well, I'll talk about that in just a second on the next one. We also start to get some reef building. So some of the first reefs, obviously they're not coral necessarily yet, but it doesn't have to be a coral reef. There's been a lot of reefs throughout time that were not the basis by coral. Some of them were these weird bivalves. Some of them were gastropods. Some of them were sponges. Some of them were some all sorts of things. So coral reefs are actually a pretty novel idea that started about in the Triassic. But we still had the earliest kind of reefs showing up during this time. Also, during the Ediacaran, we get the first bioturbation and biomineralization. So what that means is we finally get stuff digging into the sediment. So again, before this, things weren't digging in the mud. There wasn't anything doing that. This is Trepnictus, and it's probably one of one of the earlier burrow fossils that we have. And we think it's this little worm that kind of had a proboscis, and it would shoot it out, check the surface, bring it back in, scoot it over, and do it again. And this is the pattern that you're seeing from this little worm here. But again, this is the first time in our Earth's history that things are burrowing into the mud. The other thing that we get are hard parts. The first hard parts, we call them the small shelly fossils. There's a whole bunch of weird ones, but most of them look pretty tube-shaped or like cup in cup or maybe funnel in funnel. That's what most of them look like. Uh, but we're getting hard parts. Again, this is 550 million years ago. A half a billion years ago, we're getting diggers and stuff with hard parts. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to jump into the Paleozoic. We're leaving the Precambrian behind. We're coming into the Paleozoic. So we'll be talking about 538 to 252 million years ago, and we'll start with the Cambrian. So at the beginning of the Cambrian, we actually do see a small extinction of a lot of that Ediacaran squishy stuff, mainly because they live during a everybody loves everybody period of time, and then everybody didn't love everybody, and everybody started eating everybody, and they had no defenses. Like most of them were immobile. They didn't move. They were pretty, they were sitting ducks, if you will. And so we get all this stuff that comes out of the beginning of the Cambrian, and it eats it all. <laughs> so we lose it pretty quickly into the beginning of the Cambrian. Now, this complexity of life that we see, because this does look like a big jump from the Ediacaran, even from that small shelly fossils. This is a big jump. And we think that there was this really complex interplay between small environmental changes that triggered major evolutionary developments, mainly the continually rising oxygen. The more oxygen that's available in your environment, the more energy you have at your disposal. 
So this is one, uh, this is um, a reconstruction of a really famous Cambrian locality. It's the Burgess Shale. It's up in Yoho National Park in uh, British Columbia, and it's about 505 million years ago. And you may have heard of the Cambrian Explosion. For a long time, we didn't have a really good record of life before about 500 million years ago, and it seemed like all this just kind of poof, came out of nowhere. So we called it the Cambrian Explosion. Now, as you have seen through the first almost half of my talk, there was quite a bit of life already. We just get, we're getting more stuff and we're getting more hard parts and hard parts fossilize a lot easier than squishy stuff. So we're starting to get a lot more fossils because we're getting a lot more hard parts, yeah. The uh, difference between uh, oceanic water habitats versus terrestrial dry land, mm -hmm. I'm not sure, if there, was there? We have nothing on, no. So we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> you're, you're two steps ahead of me this whole time. Uh, so there was zero life on land yet. Nothing. There was, it was all rock. Everything that I've talked about thus far is in the ocean. I will let you know when we start to get life on land because that's a pretty substantial jump. Uh, but right now, this is all in the ocean. Everything before that is all in the ocean. And if you were looking at Earth from the moon a half a billion years ago, it would be gray rock. There would be zero green. There's no vegetation on, on, on land yet. Definitely no animals yet. So everything's hanging out in the ocean. But we do get our first, what I would consider relative. This is our oldest relative right here. This is Hyquithes. This is kind of the oldest fish in the fossil record. Um, yeah, it has a head and a tail, which is it's a huge advance, okay? This is a big jump to get a head and a tail. The other thing that we have, sensory organs on the head region and a tail. Ooh, that's big news. We're bilateral, bilaterally symmetrical, there we go. Which again, it's a huge jump. And there was this little tube that ran from the complex end to the tail end. So that's like a notochord, that's a precursor of a backbone. So not a backbone yet, just like a cartilage tube that ran the lift, length of the body, it had gills, it breathed oxygen, it did not have a jaw, so it just had an open mouth and just kind of swam through stuff and filter fed. But this is definitely the most complex version of life at this point in time. We have another little one down here called Pikea from the uh, Burgess Shale. And the Burgess Shale kind of represents that end, the end of the Cambrian explosion, if there is one. Now the weird thing is that trilobites do show up unannounced. They're just there. And they look like trilobites immediately. We have a couple of things from the Precambrian. Uh, they might be related. Maybe they are early Cam uh, uh, trilobites. Uh, it's iffy. But starting out, the old, we think um, using the molecular clock method, which is just using fossils and um, genetic information and dating and a lot of hypotheses. But anyways, we think that trilobites probably show up around 535 million years ago. So if we wanted to find the oldest or maybe earliest representatives of the trilobite lineage, that's where we should be looking. Those are the rocks we should be looking at. But the first actual body fossil, again, it shows up and you would be like, yes, that is a trilobite, is about 526 million years old. Oh, I need to change that. It should be 26. Um, but anyways, this is an example of one of these early trilobites. And again, they look like trilobites. But they show up really early and they take off and they diversify and they become one of the most abundant and diverse creatures on our planet during the Cambrian. So if the Cambrian had a mascot, it would be the trilobite. We'll move on to, into the Ordovician. And there was actually kind of a, a radiation event at the beginning of the Ordovician. It's called the Great Ordovician uh, Biotic. Oh, what is it? The E. Oh, shoot. I forgot. Anyways, it was pretty big. And some people are even considering this um, radiation event possibly bigger than the Cambrian one. Just of the, all the different forms of life that we get, and they show up during this time. 
So we had brachiopods, which are kind of like um, clams. They're just a little different. There's some down here. Um, we get, of course, trilobites are still hanging around. These cephalopods here, which are really cool. Um, these are related to modern nautilus, and they were massive. These were the biggest things alive on our planet during the Ordovician. So Camaroceras grew up to about, where is it, 20 feet, 20 foot long shell on this. So again, this is the largest thing on our planet. And this could be the largest thing that has ever evolved up to this point on our planet. It's the largest thing ever. And that little uh, di uh, the reconstruction behind there kind of shows what the Midwest would have looked like 455 million years ago. This is actually a scene from Illinois-ish, Illinois-ish in the Midwest. But as you can see, we do finally start to get land plants about 480 million years ago. Those are our oldest land plants. And they're not like grass or trees. They are non-vascular plants. They are little bitty. They're probably encrusting, looking more like lichen or algae at this point in time. But they're moving out of the water, though. That's a big step. That's a really, really big step for land plants at this time. It was also the time of giant trilobites. So the largest trilobite ever, which this actually is almost real size, it's 28 inches. That's, a, that's about two feet, a little over two feet right here. So this is very close to real size of this trilobite. This is the largest trilobite that we know of. And if you look down here, it's from the late Ordovician, the next biggest late Ordovician, the next biggest, biggest middle Devonian, uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. But look at this one. This is actually from the Middle Cambrian. So trilobites were already getting really big previously, in the previous slide that I talked about. And again, another one in the late Ordovician. And I will always use scale bars that are cats, always. But anyways, there's the biggest trilobite that ever lived. And it was found in Hudson Bay. All right, well, life came to an abrupt halt for a minute in our very first mass extinction event. Um, there was no substantial life on land, as we just saw, just some little tiny non-vascular plants. So this extinction was confined to the oceans. And you can see here about 85% of life on, on our planet went extinct during this time. But no major groups went extinct. Everybody just took massive hits, and then they would uh, Get, they would get better later. They came back later. So nothing was just like, like the dinosaurs at the end of the Cretaceous, which we'll talk about, of course. Of course we will. Um, so there were two pulses, and they were about a million years apart. There was this major cooling event that came in. So everything cooled down. Uh, ice sheets grew. They sucked up a bunch of water. And then the oceans went down. So think about where a lot of modern marine life lives. They live in shallow, sunlit, places. Now let's drop sea level 500 feet. What happens to all those communities that are living in those wonderful shallow in areas that are now dry? Yeah. Yep. And so that's the first pulse. So the water goes down, all the warm loving animals, boom. Well, if you were a cool loving animal or you live deeper in the oceans, you're like, hey, I'm good. So they evolved and hung out for about a million years and then everything got rapidly warm. Sea level comes up, the water gets much hotter, and all those cold adapted animals are like, who turned up the heat? And then they died. So that's kind of this two pulse extinction event that we think happened. Now, why? Why was all of this climate change happening? We're not 100% sure, but we think it has to do with the Appalachian Mountains. So the Al Appalachians were uplifting during this time. They are very, very old mountain ranges. That's why they're low hills now. They've had uh, 400 million years to erode, or actually a little bit more, 450 million years to erode. But as all of that uh, rock is eroding down um, into our oceans, it actually causes our oceans to pull more CO2 out. So you pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, it cools down, blah, blah, blah. Now, why did it warm up? Uh, maybe volcanic eruptions? We're not 100%. We can see the data. We can see the change in the isotopes. That It got cold and then it got hot again, but there's not a really great smoking gun for a, actually a lot of these mass extinctions events. We know they happened and we have ideas about why they did, um, but we're still missing kind of that key. 
So after that big mass extinction event, we move into the Silurian, and we get our first animals on land. Hooray! The first land animals happen. Uh, this is Scorpio. It is the oldest scorpion known. The first group of arthropods that go out on land are the scorpions and the millipedes. So we have all of our success to give to them. Let's see, Scorpio is 437 million years old. We also get our first vascular plants. So these little guys. This is called Cuxenia, and it's from about 425 uh, million years old, and it actually got about knee high. So that's pretty good. That's the tallest thing on land, except for this weird stuff called Prototactides. Prototactides shows up um, about the same time as Cuxenia, actually, a little later, actually. I think a little later. Um, we think it's fungus. We think it's fungus. We don't know. It is very weird and very huge. So we think that um, it had a three foot diameter and could grow up to 26 feet tall. <laughs> it was absolutely bizarre and nobody still really knows what it is. Uh, most people just kind of throw it in the junk drawer of fungus. Sure, that's what it is. But that's Prototactides. So technically, Prototactides is the largest thing on land, living on land by about 430 million years, let's say. In the oceans, though, life was flourishing in the oceans during the Silurian. We get these big things called Eurypterids, and this is probably Ye Coloptus. Ye, yeah, Coloptus. Um, and it was the largest Eurypterid known. It was argued to be the largest arthropod that ever lived at about eight and a half feet long. We have now found a giant millipede that is approaching that size too, so now it is one of the largest arthropods. This is a different type of uh, Eurypterid, and here's another one. We have these little spiny sharks. We have jawless fish, so a lot like Hykowithes, only way more advanced. Um, some of them had like armored plating around. We're still getting there. We're still getting there. This is the beginning of predator prey. We've been at predator prey for a long time. Yep, things started eating things about, oh, I'd say about 550 million years ago. But it does kick into high gear. Uh, I think it kicks into high gear in the Cambrian probably. This is just an increased predator prey. But we've had predator prey for quite some time now. The first jawed fishes, so you can see some of these spiny sharks here have little smiles on their face. Well, the first smile shows up about 440 million years ago. So Jaws was a big advance in weaponry, though. Think about that. Think about having your mouth just locked open all the time and you just like go through food and whatever gets in your mouth is what you eat. Now, you have leverage. You can open it, you can pick it up, you can crush it. So all of a sudden, things that are getting eating, eaten are like, how do we make it harder to get eaten? And so you, you start to get these massive, but these were predators, these were big, big predators at this time. Um, so they're eating other things. Most of these things on here are eating other things. There's not a whole lot of prey. Um, here's another little jawless fish down here. Did we use the words male and female yet? Yeah, oh yeah, we had sexual reproduction a long time ago. So um, yes, there were definitely male and female organisms by this point. Um, which ones were which? Meh, we don't know. Uh, but there was definitely copulation happening. A lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so well, we're... genetics comes in. Well, genetics comes in at the very beginning with our sexual, uh, sexual reproduction that happened in between 1 billion and 800 million years ago. Yep. So at that point in time, we're swapping genes, which opens up a lot of variety to us. So we got a lot of variety to play with natural selection with. Well, actually, natural selection has a lot of variety to play with. Let's say it that way. Now, the Devonian, 419 to 359 million years ago, is a really um, important time because Tetrapods come on land. We get feet and hands and legs, and we can walk, and we can support our body on land. And so these first 
three phases actually happen in the Devonian. So we go from Euthenopteron, which is, I have the, no, yes, I do. Okay, it's about 390 million years old. Tiktaalik here is about 385 million years ago, and then Ichthyostega is about 380 million years. So about every five million years, we're making mad advances um, in moving ourselves out of the water and on land. Now, what's interesting, though, is our very first evidence of stuff walking on land comes from about 390 million years old. But our first fossils of it show up much later than that, which is kind of weird that we haven't found anything that looks like this 390 million years ago, even though we have legit footprints. And we don't even have a tail drag mark. Like they were holding their tails up and they were walking, they were scooting. They were doing this number. So again, that's telling researchers where to look for those early fossils. You need to be in rocks that are 390 million years old to find the track makers. We get the first tree-like fossils. We get these big root systems in New York. So we get the first forests. They're spore-bearing plants, so we haven't got to seeds yet. Uh, but they are vascular. By the late Devonian, we do get the first seeds, which was huge for plant evolution. And the largest reefs of all time were during the Devonian, the largest that we've ever had on our planet. Over 3 million square miles of reef. That's 10 times the extent of our modern reef systems. They are huge. The Glass Mountains in Texas, for example, is one of these giant Devonian reefs, if you ever get down there. Now, another character from the Devonian is this guy named Lee Hall. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. This is my friend. <laughs> and he used to work at the Cleveland Museum that has the largest skull of Dunkleosteus. And Dunkleosteus was a placoderm. It was an armored fish. And all we have of its body is the head. So this armored plating around its skull, the rest of its body was cartilaginous. So we don't have fossils of it. And there's a lot of people that have tried to figure out how big that fish would have been. Because that, that Lee is a big guy, and that is a big skull. So we've got 2007, 2007, 2017, and 2023 coming down here. So we started out a little small. We got really big, we got really big, <laughs> and then we got really small again. And so what we have to do is we have to estimate the size based on much smaller fish. We're also not 100% sure, since we don't have the rest of the body of Dunkleosteus, is who its closest relative was. Who should we even be comparing this to in the fossil record? And depending on which group of extinct fish that you're comparing Dunkleosteus to, you get much different estimates on size. So right now, is this big? in comparison to some earlier reconstructions. So it's like this short little thick thing versus some of these longer fish here. So I've heard through the grapevine that there's already rebuttals coming out about the small estimate on this fish, but we'll see. Hopefully one of these days we'll find soft body preservation to give us an idea of how long these fish actually were, and then that'll let us know who it's related to and we can get some better estimates on its total length but it was definitely the top predator. This is the apex predator of the Devonian period. There are optics involved there. Yep, so they had these um, very similar to sclerotic rings like birds have right here. So that was the harder armor plating around its eyeball. But it's not bifocal because the eyes are- We have no idea how it saw its world. We have no idea what type of optics this fish had. We could guess all day, but who knows? Are those, it's so very clean, are those teeth or? <laughs> They're sort of, they're armored plates. So this right here is actually the lower jaw and it is like sharpened, but it's self sharpened by the upper armored plating. That's a jaw. But it's very strange. Yes, the, the teeth aren't actually teeth. They're not enamel and dentine. They're made out of these weird uh, bony plates. The other really cool thing about Dunkleosteus is it has, we think, the fastest mouth opening in the West. Um, it could open its mouth so fast that it created suction. 
So it, all it had to do was get close to you and then open its mouth rapidly and it would just pull you in, like create a vacuum by how fast it opened and closed its mouth, which is absolutely great. I don't know how they figured that out, some type of biomechanics, but it's fun. So then again, life hits the second mass extinction event at the end of the Devonian. Um, and this is a series of extinctions we, we see over a period of about 25 million years. And there were about 10 different episodes of extinction that were greater than the natural background extinction rate that we would expect for life. Life naturally dies out. It doesn't stay around forever. And the main cause, we know the main cause was low oxygen in our oceans. Our oceans had super low oxygen. But why is still a big debate? This is probably one of the most unknown extinction events, other than we know that the, there's huge anoxic layers in our oceans from this time period. So we know there was no oxygen, but why there was no oxygen is still a big question. And there's been a lot of potential causes, so let me just go over this list for you. Um, a large volcano, sure, why not? Uh, asteroid pin. Impact. Okay. Yeah. Where, where's, the, <laughs> where's the crater? Um, let's see. A hole in the ozone layer that increased ultraviolet radiation and screwed up everybody's genetics. Sure. Why not? Um, uh, these newly formed forests. This is actually the one on the, the top of the list of what we think is going on. So the Devonian had the, the world's first forests. And what do forests do? They pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so we think that possibly this, all, this whole mass extinction event could have been driven just by the evolution of forests and the massive increase of plants over time. And then also even a supernova has been proposed as why all this life went extinct at the end. But it really only affected marine life. Again, we've got some arthropods on land, not a whole lot going on. We do have big forests and stuff, and we're starting to get some tetrapods, but it's still pretty low stakes on land. So most of the 75% is still in the oceans. And placoderms were one of the groups that they were wiped out completely. So Dunkleosteus and all of its kin, poof, gone at the end of the Devonian. So now we'll get into the Carboniferous, which is one of my personal favorites. And I have a couple videos here. So this is a video. Father, what? Yep, OK. This is an exhibit. And everything, of course, is in vertical format nowadays through social media. Uh, but this is a, a museum exhibit at the Burpee Museum in Rockford, Illinois. And this is home of the famous Maison Creek. But this is their big middle exhibit. It goes two story high. It's absolutely wonderful. But here is Aerops, um, this early Timnospondyl, these weird amphibians looking up into these big scale trees. So the trees that you're seeing today are not the trees that we have today. Um, they're not angiosperms. They're not flowering plants. I don't even uh, think in, only a few handful of them can actually be considered uh, gymnosperms. This big giant thing right here is a giant horsetail. Um, and then we got a big griffin fly, the big dragonfly sitting on a scale tree. And of course, the big um, uh, millipede that we'll talk about in just a second. So that is land during the Carboniferous. We have these lush forests. We have these giant arthropods roaming around. We've got a diversity of tetrapods at this point in time. But in the oceans, things were also pretty great. This will be, eventually, this, you, some of you may recognize this. This is the Bear Gulch diorama at the Museum of the Rockies. And it's one of the best Bear Gulch dioramas that I've ever seen. I've only actually seen two, and this one is the superior one. Um, but this is a big uh, shark called Stethacanthus. You have some other little fishies in here. Um, I can't remember what this one is called. Uh, but tons of different sharks. And you can kind of see here Stethacanthus in this reconstruction here. Um, I can't remember how to pronounce this guy's name. But what I'm trying to get a, uh, across here with these two is that sharks get weird. Sharks go through their experimental phase of their evolution in the Carboniferous. So they start um, sporting mohawks. Uh, they start sporting these really 
bizarre teeth structures. They do a whole bunch of weird stuff all in the Carboniferous. That looked like a mustache on that animal. Yeah, it does kind of look like a mustache. What, what, what's the function of those? Probably feelers like catfish. Yeah. So it's not, they're not, uh, they're not an optical. Nope, eyes, balls, eyeballs here. These would have been snoot sensors. Two different ways. Mm -hmm. What else happened during the Carboniferous? Um, yes, our peak insects. We get a, our oldest beetle is found during this time. Uh, we're going to talk about Arthropleura in just a second. We get our first reptile, which is really the amniotic egg. So we get an enclosed egg. Animals now that had moved on land were all amphibians. So they had to reproduce in water still. They did not have a hard-shelled egg or a soft-shelled egg that they could lay somewhere else and then go off and do their thing. So during the Carboniferous, though, the actual egg, dry land egg, evolved. And that ushered in our first reptiles. Did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, was this before or after organisms uh, evolved to break down the lake? Before. So that brings a really good point, actually. So this is called the Carboniferous because there's a massive amount of carbon in the Carboniferous. And the reason for that is because you had all those scale trees. They were huge. Some of them got up to 100 feet tall. These are massive tree-like plants. They're not technically trees yet because they don't have wood. They're falling over like crazy. Everything's just, uh, as you can kind of see in that video, there's just limbs hanging everywhere, trunks hanging everywhere. Things are falling down constantly. But there were no decomposers yet. This forest-like environment evolved so quickly that microbes had not evolved to be able to deal with their materials yet. So they weren't breaking them down like they do today. And so they just build up and build up and build up and build up and build up. And then time and pressure buries them and squishes them and changes them. So they go from like a lignin to a dusty black coal to a shiny black coal to anthracite. So over time and temperature and pressure, these ancient Carboniferous for forests have been transformed into the basis of our human society, fossil fuels. Well, coal, fossil fuels. So this is before that, but very shortly after, that whole thing changes, the decomposers show up, and you don't get those huge, massive carbon sinks anymore of these plants that are just being buried without decomposing. Uh, first, uh, yes, Hylonomus, about 315 million years, we get that egg. And then this little picture is super cute, because this is a parent, and that's a baby. And we think that this is the first tetrapod that shows parental care in the fossil record. It probably happened way before that, but this is the first time we actually have evidence of it in the fossil record. And that's about 306 million years ago. We have parental care. All right, we're gonna quickly talk about giant arthropods because this is a really long talk. Oh my God. Uh, so they, m the biggest arthropods that we've had on our planet happen about this time. And actually, it goes from the very, very late Carboniferous into the early Permian. So this is Meganeuropsis. This is a giant griffin fly, very closely related to our modern dragonflies, but they're a little different. Um, but it's huge. I mean, it's got, um, it's like pigeon-sized wingspan. This is a massive flying insect. And this is Arthropleura, the giant millipede. And the newest specimen that we found of this pushes this thing up to about eight and a half feet long. We did a whole episode about eons if you want to hear me talk about it more. Um, now why? Why do we have this abundant of giant arthropods? We still have big arthropods today, but none of them get this big. So what's happening? So one thing that people talk about a lot is oxygen. So oxygen peaks at this time. We are now at like 21%. Oxygen gets up to like 32% um, during the late Carboniferous and into the early Permian. This guy lived in the early Permian. And so the way insects breathe is much different than us. They don't have a diaphragm and lungs. They have all these tiny little tubes that go along their body. Yep, sphericals, exactly right. And oxygen passively diffuses into the body and is dispersed throughout the muscle tissues. And so if you have a whole bunch more oxygen, you can actually get a much bigger insect because it can take on more oxygen to support such a big body. 
Now that might be true for the flying insects, the griffin flies, because we do see the biggest ones show up in the early Permian. But Arthropleura here tripped us up quite a bit because what we see is a little different in its evolution. The oldest specimen of Arthropleura that is from the late Carboniferous, and it's actually lived before that big oxygen spike, is the biggest known specimen. And they get smaller as we get closer to the Permian boundary. So what's going on there? Well, we actually think that Arthropleura got big because it could, just because it could. Think about it. There were hardly any large predators on land at this point in time. We have our first reptiles, and I'm not talking about alligators. I'm talking about lizards that are about this big. That is not a predator. Mm -mm. Maybe if you were a tiny little insect, but if you're eight and a half feet long, you're going to eat that lizard. So some of the bigger tetrapods might have been able to do something with a small one like this, but really they were kind of unchecked. There was also, we think, if they ate the same things as modern millipedes do, the world was their oyster. Remember, the, er, the Carboniferous was full of all of that not decomposing plant material. So if they ate plant material, there was an abundance of it. We also seem to only find it kind of in the equatorial zones. So maybe the forests were just at the right place at just the right time with just the right circumstances to allow such a large arthropod. Because later in the Permian, oxygen does go down. We do lose our big griffin flies, but we don't lose our um, arthropleura until it dries out. So it likes to these wet, humid forests. And when they disappeared, so did arthropleura. But we think at least in Arthropleura's case, it was just at the right place at the right time to get that insanely huge from an arthropod. Griffin flies and some of the other bigger flying insects, because this isn't the only one, probably had a lot to do with the oxygen, but at least not for Arthropleura. It broke the rules, kind of like that Goldilocks zone. There's a couple of other ideas that have to do with predator-prey relationships, uh, that there was no predators. There definitely was no aerial predators at this time. These are the first things that flew on our planet. So the first time anything got off the ground was these griffin flies in the late Carboniferous, early Permian. So that was a whole niche that nobody had exploited yet. So for griffin flies, heck yeah, woo, take off. The other thing is those really, really high oxygen levels are actually poisonous. They're toxic to larval insects. So baby insects cannot control how much oxygen they're getting, and too much of a good thing is bad. And so if you um, happen to lay bigger ones, just throw with the dice genetically, your larvae are a little bit bigger than your neighbors, they are better able to deal with those higher oxygen rates, but then they also grow to be bigger in individuals that also have bigger eggs, that also grow into bigger individuals. And you have natural selection selecting for larger larvae that can handle that high oxygen level. So that's another kind of idea about why arthropods got so big during this time. Um, but I think it probably has to do with all of the ideas. It was, it was kind of the Goldilocks zone. Mm -hmm. I, I wondered about several earlier ones, but these Latin names that have been assigned to these, mm -hmm. apparently you get, if you know Latin, you mm -hmm. can actually read information mm -hmm. from them. Yep. I, I assume the, who, is, who, get, who gets credit for giving the Latin names that end up being permanent? Whoever publishes first. So whoever writes the paper first that describes a creature and gives it the name, that's the one we stick with. I was just thinking, even though that's being the case. There, there are rules. So there's a whole book. It's called the Zoological Nomenclature something or other. It's actually not that big, but it is very intimidating. And it has all the rules and regulations for naming new species. So you just can't name it Bob. Like, I can't just, like, well, publish. The second, the second half of this one on the left, yeah, so a lot of times what we do when we name these things, the name either has some type of characteristic of the animal, uh, is dedicated to the guy or girl that discovered them, um, dedicated to the place that it was discovered. Um, so like Equus Idahoensis, 
take a shot. What do you think it's named after? Idaho. Where do you think it's found? Idaho. Well, where it was first found. Yeah. So it's usually based on um, person, place, or thing. Your nouns, basically, is what we use to name stuff. And like I said, there's a whole giant rule book, and people will call you out. If, like, when you publish your paper in a peer reviewed journal and you've done something wrong, they will let you know that it's not valid. Can you dissect the other name on the right? Mega Neuropsis, it has something to do with giant wing. Giant wing? Mega being big, neuro, um, I think is wing and opsis. No, opsis is wing and neuro, I don't know, veined wing? I'm not sure. Um, I did not break the breakdown, breakdowns for all these names, so I don't know them for any of them, just for future reference. <laughs> right. Congratulations, we all are. All right, so let's jump into the Permian. This is my favorite creature of the Permian. It's also found pretty close to us. It's found in Idaho. I don't know why we haven't found any in Montana yet. We have the same formation that it's found in in Montana, but we haven't found any here, so... Heads up, be looking for these. Um, this is called Helicoprion. It's a very weird shark, very weird shark. And it has this tooth whirl. And this is actually what we found first. And this is all we found. And it confused people for a very long time. I believe the first one was found in Russia in the 1800s. And we were very confused. Um, we tried to put that structure all over the body, on the nose, on the fins, on the tail, um, in the mouth, but in weird ways. Uh, and then we found a specimen that had a little tiny bit of the cartilage of the jaw joint preserved around the tooth whirl. And we're like, oh my god. It sets in the jaw vertically like a saw blade, and it doesn't have any teeth on top. These is where, this is where the new tooth forms. But instead of just like spitting them out like normal sharks, they roll them up. So these are old teeth. These are new teeth, new to old. Very strange. Um, it didn't last long. We find these basically in the late Permian to early Triassic and then pfft. So whatever they were doing wasn't very efficient, unfortunately, because they look bizarre. Um, but what we think they were doing is eating cephalopods. So this is the shell. This is the meaty goodness down here. So what these fish would do is suck in a cephalopod meaty end first, probably, and shuck it out of the shell. <laughs> and all these teeth are facing backwards, so all that meaty goodness gets caught in it. And then probably using the upper no tooth zone as your <laughs> suction, and just pull it right out of the shell. Did, did that creature masticate? We don't know. This is as far as we've got. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, jaw piece was found more recently. I want to say in like 2017-ish, maybe, uh, is when we figured out that it's, a lot of people were thinking it went there, but we didn't have any evidence of it yet. And so that evidence is pretty new. But that's, uh, that's, that's the going hypothesis at the moment, is that it's shucking um, the soft parts out of shells. They were pretty big. Um, did I write that down? Of course not. Um, I think some of them got over 10 feet long. They could be relatively big. The whorls themselves are about this big in diameter across, yeah. So it could be a pretty large fish. I've only seen one um, reconstructed like in full size, and I guarantee it was over nine feet long. Okay, what else have I got in here? Ooh, yes, so uh, tetrapods go wild in the Permian. We get all sorts of weird stuff happening in the Permian. So let me make sure I have my list here. All right, so we have these synapsids here. Synapsids are on the mammal line. They're not, they're not mammals yet, but they're on the mammal line versus the sauropsid line that would go to lots more reptiles. So they're, they're down here, but they're, Mammal-ish, I guess. Mammal-ish. Basically, synapsids don't have any holes in their skull. 
for muscle attachment. Think of like a T-Rex skull and it has all those holes on the side of its head and then think about our solid human skull. That's what I'm talking about. Not like nasal hole and eyeball holes, but the holes on the side of the head for muscle attachment. We don't have those. We're not diapsids. Those are the reptiles. We're synapsids. And these things also don't have holes in their skulls. So we think that they're more related to us than they are to reptiles. You may have heard these called mammal-like reptiles, but we don't use that anymore. We use like proto-mammal or stem mammal. Then we also have the therapsids, which are kind of like a step up from the synapsids. And actually in the late Permian, they take over and they replace all of those ancient looking synapsids. And we're left with just these weird little therapsids. They're wonderfully weird. Some of them are very large, yes. Um, let's see. Dimetrodon is pretty big, but Astemaminosuchus, one of the best names ever, that's actually pretty big. It's probably cow size. Um, so is Adaphylosaurus is pretty long. It would probably, it'd probably be a little longer than this screen. And the sail probably came up to about here. Same thing with Dimetrodon. Um, this guy was pretty small, Dictyodon. I could set it on the table here. Um, but some of them are pretty large, and some of them are a little smaller. Some of the features look like they may be part of breeding things, too, like those fan-shaped things. We have no idea what the sails are for. A lot of people have been like, oh, it's temperature regulation, it's for sexual selection, it's for interspecies identification. Uh, it has been talked about a lot, and we still really have no idea what the purpose is. Male and female versions of these. As far as we know, all of their skeletons look the same. The same? Yep. So for a big, huge portion of the history on life uh, on our planet, there's no real skeletal differences between male and female. Like for dinosaurs, we have no idea. No idea. The Tyrannosaurus rex Sue at the Field Museum, it's called Sue because Sue found it. Not because it's a girl. It goes by they, them pronouns. Like f for real, legitimately. That's, they have a plaque about it and everything. So it's letting people know that Sue is just the discoverer of it. It's not, has anything to do with the sex. So, but breeding, breeding procedures do have something to do with genetics. Right, obviously they're, they're doing it. They're making babies. But we don't know which ones were male and which ones were female. Undoubtedly, the differences between male and female were all external. Coloration, probably. And so they could see the differences in color, but color doesn't survive the fossilization record. So for example, let's take a red bird, a cardinal. We're gonna take a male and a female red bird. We take all the feathers off, take all the meat off, and we're gonna fossilize it. Is there any way you're gonna tell the difference between that male and female bird without having the feathers? No, they're exactly the same on the inside. It's the outside that makes the male and female different. Without like literally the parts <laughs> being preserved in soft tissue and all of these probably had internal parts that came out to do the deed and then went back in like a snake. Um, I'm being as PG as possible people. <laughs> um, I don't know what homos you've been rolling around with but uh, uh, most of ours are external. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, so that's a really tough question. Okay, I didn't, I didn't lose any of them. I'm double mic'd here. <clears throat> but yeah, that's a huge question. And we debate that going all the way up. I'm not sure when we officially get something that we're like, oh yeah, that's a male and that's a female. And we know it because the, the skeleton is different and we can see it. But even then we have to guess. Not every single representative of male and female is one way or the other. For example, males being bigger than the females. Most sharks, females are way bigger than the males. Great white sharks, the biggest ones are always female. 
So how do you know if you're looking at a big one and a little one, whether one's a male or one's a female, if you don't really know which one is the bigger one? So we can say there's probably sexual dimorphism and we assume one is the male and one is the female. And here are all the reasons why. But again, unless we get soft tissue preservation, that actually has the parts. <laughs> it's pretty hard to tell. Even if we had color preserved, we assume males are flashier, but that's definitely not the case across all of the animal kingdom. So it would be really hard to figure these out. The most important of these group of animals, though, to us is this cynodont up here. Now, cynodonts show up about 260 million years ago. They diversify, and they give rise to mammals. So on this slide, this is our oldest relative on this slide, is that little guy up there. All right, where are we at? Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I made this way too long, by the way. Uh, we also have the third mass extinction event, and this is the big one, guys. This is the closest that life has ever been completely like wiped off our planet. So 95% of life kaput, and a whole bunch of groups finito. So trilobites, for example. Trilobites have made it through every single extinction event up to this point. They're wiped out by it. So no more of those guys. A whole bunch of those land animals that I just showed you go extinct. Luckily, cynodonts hold on because they give rise to mammals later. Now, this extinction event is probably due to some massive volcanic eruptions, but not like boom volcanic eruptions, seep volcanic eruptions. So just like this lava, just like pfft, over tens of thousands of square miles, it created lava flows multiple kilometers thick. It pumped out a extreme amount of CO2 into the atmosphere. Sound familiar? Um, and so we got this uh, massive warming in deserts, desertification, um, huge wildfires that wiped out forests, that toxified the waters. This is fresh water. And we're getting these toxic algal blooms because of all the runoff coming from land. Um, so after stuff burns, it's full of nutrients. And so it was like algae fertilizer. And as algae grows and dies, it sucks out all the oxygen from the water. And so you get big fish kills like this or like what's happening on our Gulf Coast right now. All the nasty red tides this is basically what's happening here. So it was a really bad day, a uh, really bad time, really. Just some millions of years was, was real awful on, on the planet Earth. Um, land temperatures got up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That was hot. Um, we had these toxic gases that were spewing out that uh, destroyed the ozone layer. So high UV radiation, that's no good. We got acid rain that killed the forests, and the blooms of algae that killed all the stuff in the water and choked the rivers and the lakes. The oceans got as hot as a hot tub, 104 degrees Fahrenheit. That's tough. And so all of that hotness and all of that increased CO2 was also reacting with the seawater, so it was making it more acidic. All of this should sound very familiar to you because it's happening real time today. And we're really scared because out of all of the extinction events that I'm gonna talk about today, this one is the closest to our current predicament. And this one is the closest that life has ever been exterminated on our planet. Ooh. Sorry, there's really no silver lining to this talk. <laughs> At least when it comes to extinction events and our current predicament. So all of this happened in about 120,000 years. That's really fast. But the scary thing, again, is when we look at the speed of change in the Permian, it looks like a kiddie roller coaster compared to the psycho roller coaster that we're on right now. So we're changing the atmosphere faster than it did during the worst extinction event on the planet. So it's not that climate has changed over time. Climate has always changed over time. It's the rate of change. And we're changing really, 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 really fast. Faster than we have at any point in the history of our planet is right now. So let's move on to the Mesozoic and talk about dinosaurs. All right, so I just want to introduce Pangea. 
because I think it's really important to know that arc plates have moved around throughout this entire talk. And at this point, we've come to a supercontinent called Pangaea. It's kind of a big C shape. And we have this global ocean called the Panthalassic. Down here is Gondwana. These are the southern continents. So uh, Antarctica, Australia, India is right here. Africa, South, uh, South America is here. North America, Asia, and Siberia is all up here. So this is where dinosaurs would eventually evolve. Now, Pangaea officially closed and came together in the early Triassic, and then it would actually start to break up um, throughout the entire Mesozoic. But this is where we start. Boom, 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 boom. Pangaea, yes. All right, so the Triassic. We, it took a while to get over the great dying, the end Permian extinction event. It actually took probably about 10 million years for life to recover to the levels of diversity that there were before the extinction event. Obviously all the animals are different, but the amount of diversity that we have took about 10 million years. Now, um, mammals, we get the cyanodonts. There's this little guy here. Um, we get our first dinosaurs, this one. Niasosaurus, about 240 million years ago. So that's actually towards um, eh, early-ish, middle-ish. We get our first pterosaurs, so the first flying reptiles show up in the Triassic, about 220 million years. Um, and this, this little thing right here, um, is actually a proto-mammal, or we call it a mammalia form. It's right outside the mammal family tree. It's like the base of our family tree right here. And they show up about 220 million years. So we got a whole bunch of stuff, first timers, showing up at the beginning of the Triassic. We get our proto-mammals, our pterosaurs, and our first dinosaurs. However, dinosaurs were not top dogs at this time. They were tiny. They maybe only made up 6, 10% of the environment. And here's one right here. Now you may be thinking to yourself, well, Callie, <laughs> there's two giant dinosaurs on the screen right in front of you. What are you talking about? These aren't dinosaurs, actually. This is a Rossukian. It's a specialized crocodilian, basically, which is terrifying because if you notice, it's bipedal. But, yep, that's one of those early pterosaurs. Yep. Uh, where was this one? Yes. Okay. And this little guy here is an aetosaur, which is another type of reptile. But it was really interesting that the non-dinosaur reptile line was kind of experimenting with um, what we mostly consider to be dinosaur traits at this time. The armored dinosaurs, the ankylosaurs, look very similar to the aetosaurs. Dinosaurs proper, the theropods, are looking a lot. They look a lot like Rossukians. But luckily for the dinosaurs, we get an extinction event. But before I talk about that, let's check out the oceans because there's still life in the oceans. This is a site called the Paris site and it's not in France, it's in Idaho. <laughs> Why it's the Paris site, I don't know. But anyways, uh, they have found a wealth of animals from the Paris site. And do I have what? 242 million years. So a lot of people think that this area of what would become Idaho was actually a refugia somewhere that wasn't hit as bad or as hard as the rest of the world and was able to take off running as things kind of chilled out. The other thing is we get the Shoshonosaurs. So these are ichthyosaurs, they're reptiles, they're swimming reptiles, they're not dinosaurs. And this is the biggest one we know of. And it got about 70 feet long. That's the average length of a normal blue whale. Blue whales get way bigger than that, but most of them hang out around 70 feet long. So these were big animals. Now again, mass extinction, boom, the fourth one. This is a Triassic mass extinction event, and we think it had to do with the rifting of Pangaea. As Pangaea was breaking apart, it was screwing things up for everybody, as breakups usually do. We think that there was some more pulses of volcanic activity over about 600,000 years that was screwing up the atmosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, uh, yep, 
we're drastically increasing CO2. Yep, more acidic, boo, hiss, boo, hiss. The same story, climate change. Uh, but it wipes out almost, almost or all the Rosukians, the Aedosaurs, all those dinosaur wonder, wannabes, they're gone. So by the time we get to the Jurassic, other things take over, including birds. This is Ankyornis. This is the oldest bird avalon group. It still is in not 100% what we think of as a modern bird, aves, but it's in a bigger group that contains modern birds. So it's a little weird still, so it still has the long tail. It still has claws on the wings, and it still has teeth in the mouth or the beak. But otherwise, everything about this individual looks like a bird. So we put it down towards the bottom of the bird family tree, kind of with um, Archaeopteryx. So we get the flying dinosaurs. For the first time, we get flying dinosaurs. Pterosaurs are flying reptiles. They are not related to dinosaurs. Now, these little guys probably evolved from very, very small theropod dinosaurs, like Truodon, the famous Truodon from the Museum of the Rockies, Egg Mountain. And they show up about 160 million years ago. We get the first placental mammal at this point. This is Jeremiah, and it's about 160 million years old, too. So that's really exciting for us placentals. That's where we show up. So again, on this page, this is our oldest relative. Leedzichthys is the largest bony fish that has ever lived. It was about the size of a whale shark. And it was a bony fish, not cartilaginous, bony fish, like a trout or a salmon. It got really, really big. But probably the most important thing that comes out of the Jurassic is the Morrison Formation. So we went from 6 to 10% of life being dinosaurs at the early Triassic to dinosaurs being the ultimate land livers at this time. They take over every large niche. We get sauropods, the biggest thing that have ever walked on land. We get a ton of different types of dinosaurs. The Morrison Formation is probably, arguably, one of the most important and famous Jurassic Age localities in the world. It outcrops over a large portion of the US. It's kind of hard to see, but there is a red dot. Um, and most of the Western states have a little bit of Jurassic Morrison formation. Like we have a tiny little bit down in South Central, I think, Montana. Picture. Yeah, there is for scale. The ones are very tiny. Because they were really big. The, this is a six foot tall human right here. So that animal is about, oh, 80 to 90 feet long at least, and probably weighs upwards to 50 to 70 tons. Yeah? Is that the one that was discovered in Argentina? No. These are all from the Morrison, all from Western US. There are some wonderful sites down in South America with all of the much bigger sauropods. Uh, so they got way bigger than this. And the largest is Pataga Titan that lived, well, what we think of as the biggest. Um, that's actually a really hard question to answer. Do you mean tallest, longest, heaviest, biggest? Um, but anyways, the, the, what we think of as the biggest sauropod, Pataga Titan, lived in South America. But this is the Morrison Formation. And what's really amazing, though, is that <laughs> these are <laughs> incredibly large animals, and all of them are found in the same formation. These animals would have been eating, what, 500, 1,500 pounds of vegetation a day? They were like locusts. They would have gone through, ate everything, and moved on. But what's cool is they had very specific food ranges. So like these guys only ate the tops of the trees. These guys only ate the mid-levels. These guys only ate the low levels. These guys ate the ground level. So they all had their own niche within the environment that allowed all of these sauropods to live in the same place at the same time, which is absolutely. They were all herbivores. Right. Yep, they were all eating plants, and these guys were eating them. Only they didn't eat them as adults, they ate them as babies. So just like today, baby animals are on the menu for everybody else. And that's the exact same way it would have been back in the Jurassic. We'll move on to the Cretaceous now. 
145 to 66 million years ago, we get the largest flying animal ever, so Quetzalcoatlus, and its relatives are the biggest thing that have ever flew. This is the size of a giraffe. Uh, the wingspan is about the size of a Cessna airplane. It was absolutely massive. Their bones are found in Texas. And what's really fun is it's eating a baby sauropod, which I think is hilarious. We also get our first true modern birds, like actual 100% all the characteristics of a bird at the very late Cretaceous. So we have a short tail. The wings come back. You can't even see the tail because it's short. We have scaly legs no claws on the wings anymore, and a true beak without any teeth. So we get our very, very first true birds during this time. It's called the wonder chicken. <laughs> I think that's pretty cute. Uh, and it shows up at the very, very end, like 66.7 million years ago is when we get wonder chicken. We get the earliest grass about 100 million years ago. So before that, there was like no grass. So ground covering would have been a little different. We get the first flowers about 140 million years ago, and we get the oldest ants and termites about 100 million years ago. Now, during the Cretaceous, we get the Western Interior Seaway. And so this is a seaway that connected the Arctic Ocean with the Gulf of Mexico. Here's Montana, it's right here. So you can kind of see, uh, this is kind of the maximum Western Interior Seaway right here. These pictures show you the evolution the opening and closing of the seaway. So it goes oldest, 130, 115, then we go down, 105, 92, 85, 75, 72, 65. So you can see by the time the dinosaurs all died out, there was just kind of a little puddle left of it. 85 million years ago is probably around the peak. It was at its widest and its deepest. Now the reason why the seaway formed is because of plate tectonics. So you had the oceanic Juan de Fuca plate subducting underneath the western margin of the North American plate. Normally, they dive down at a pretty steep angle, and they just go straight down. For whatever reason, the Juan de Fuca plate was like, no, I'm going to stay up top. And it just kind of bounced against the North American plate and was attached to it, but still kind of diving down. So it starts to pull the plate down with it because they're stuck together. Now, once it starts to empty out, that Juan de Fuca plate detaches and officially starts its deep dive, and the continental plate rebounds back up and the water drains out. So that's how the Western Interior Seaway formed. Now, there's all sorts of wonderful life in the Western Interior Seaway. So I'm from Kansas originally, and these are the types of fossils that I think about when I think about Cretaceous. I'm not thinking about T-Rex or Triceratops because you don't find them in Kansas because we were underwater like the whole time T-Rex and Triceratops was alive. But we have the largest mosasaur that's ever been found, Tylosaurus is right here. We had giant ammonites that were about the size of me. That's how tall they were. We had Protostega, a giant sea turtle. Not the biggest of all time, but right next to the biggest of all time. You also had this little fish back here. It's actually not a little fish. It's about 14 feet long. It's called Xyphactinus. We call it the bulldog fish because its face is kind of smashed up. <clears throat> but it also was a really poor eater. Like, it didn't know its limits, basically, um, because a lot of the articulated skeletons that we find, so when we find the whole fish laid out dead on the rock, there is another fish about half of its size inside of it. <laughs> and it hasn't been digested yet. So they died at the same time. So these fish ate things that were too big for them. The too big thing that it tried to eat was like, I don't want to be eaten today. Freaks out, and everybody gets punctured, and everybody dies together. So there's a really famous fossil at the Sternberg Museum in Hayes, Kansas, Fort Hayes, Kansas, um, that's called the fish within a fish. And it's a 14-foot long fish with a 7-foot long fish on the inside. And they're both perfectly preserved. Nope, these are all fish. Uh, this mosasaur would have had to. This is an air breather, yeah, a swimming reptile. This is Hesper Ornus, a diving bird. It actually still had teeth. It was very strange. It was like six foot tall. I didn't realize it was so big. Um, I just learned recently more about it. And this up here is a plesiosaur. Might be a Lasmosaurus, I'm not sure. Uh, but this one and this one, this one and this one 
all breathed air. So they would have had to come up eventually. Uh, but Mosasauruses were fully aquatic. They still breathed air, but they gave birth to live young in the water like whales do. So they weren't going out and laying their eggs there. Protostega, we think, acted just like a modern sea turtle. So it was probably going up on land, burying its eggs, and peacing out. Now what's fun is we do find dinosaur remains in marine sediments that are from the Western Interior Seaway. And the reason why is because of this amazing uh, phenomenon called bloat and float. So let's take this hadrosaur here. It died on the coastline of the Western Interior Seaway. And as you decompose, you bloat. And let's say the tide came in right as you were bloating. And you bloated and you floated out to sea, where you then disarticulate and fall down. There was a lot of predators. These are two different species of shark, and they would have scavenged for sure. So all of this dinosaur material usually has shark bites all over it, which is kind of fun. But that's all from bloat and float. The most famous uh, Cretaceous formation, I would say, would be the Hell Creek Formation right here in Montana. It actually has some exposures some elsewhere. Uh, this is a really fun reconstruction of some of the dinosaurs that you find in the Hell Creek Formation, but it's from a game, like an online game, but they did a really good job with their reconstructions. I mean, they even have some of the big turtles that you find. Uh, but this is uh, Triceratops, you got your T-Rex, your Ankylosaurus, um, <clears throat> your Dromaeosaurus, Pachycephalosaurus, all of those dinosaurs lived at the very end of the Cretaceous. But then they all died. <laughs> So this is our fifth and last mass extinction that we'll be talking about today. And the fifth mass extinction, the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction that wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs was a really bad day that actually happened in the early spring, uh, late spring or early summer. We know that. We know actually when it hit. So there was um, a couple of things happening during this time. There was huge volcanic eruptions going on in India called the Deccan Traps. And again, not explosive, but spewing. Just spewing lava out. And then, so you had some climate change. A giant space rock hit our planet. Probably the most famous extinction event. So a seven mile wild asteroid, I have to read you some of this because like, uh, mind-blowingly bad day on our planet. A seven mile wide asteroid larger than Mount Everest, Mount Everest moving up to 25 miles per second struck our planet in what's now the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. This uh, excerpt is from a book, I should say, called Ends of the Worlds. It's wonderful. It's all about these mass extinction events. Highly encourage it. You probably have it here. The impact created so much heat that for a moment it was several times hotter than the sun's surface. It liquefied all the rock around it. It instantly created a hole more than 20 miles deep. It was like 100 million megatons of TNT went off. 100 million megatons. Anything within 1,000 miles of the impact would have been set on fire. Material was ejected into orbit and spread around the globe within an hour. Then it started to fall. All that ejecta, is, it goes up, it's got to come down. So it comes down in such an amount that it turned the sky red and broiled the surface of the planet. And that lasted for about a half an hour. So if you were on the surface during that time, if you can live in your oven set at broil, you'd be all right. The last effect was the sonic boom, a blast of air traveling that would still be traveling almost 200 meters per hour, nearly 2,000 miles away. So like hurricane force F5 tornado wind, still. 2,000 miles away from the impact. The impact triggered landslides, earthquakes, and tsunamis. And all of that stuff that was still left in the atmosphere blocked out the sun and cooled the climate. So we were in what we call an impact winter. Instead of a nuclear winter, impact winter. This caused a food chain breakdown 
And so uh, if you block out the sun, your photosynthesizers are going to suffer pretty hard, right? And if you're one of these giant plant eaters that need to eat 1,500 pounds of vegetation every day and all of your plants die, what happens to you? If you're a T-Rex and you need to eat 500 pounds of meat every single day and all of your giant prey items die, what happens to you? So it had a food chain breakdown because it started at the very bottom of our food chain with the photosynthesizers and knocked them out and it was a cascade effect down. And so most of the survivors were small. Like an alligator was the largest thing alive on our planet directly after the impact. So we went from the largest terrestrial animals ever to crocodiles in like a week probably. And those that were able to burrow or to hide out, like probably our ancestors, so our little burrowing mammal ancestors, we probably chilled out. We just like waited for the coast to be clear and then popped out later. Um, insectivores, things that ate insects, scavengers, oh boy, a scavenger bonanza, if you can imagine everything on the planet dying fairly quickly. So if you were a scavenger, an insectivore, if you could, um, if an omnivorous eat tubers and seeds, things that can hang out longer than just fresh meat and flesh, fresh plants, you're all right. But there definitely was a size bias. So basically anything bigger than a reptile, a, a, a crocodile, toast. All right, so let's get into the Cenozoic. So I just got a couple pictures here to kind of show you what life was like. Now, the Paleogene includes the Paleocene, Eocene, and Oligocene. <clears throat> and it goes from about 66 to 23 million years ago. And a lot of the mammals that evolved directly after the extinction event, so this is about 15 million years, give or take, um, after the extinction event. And uh, you can see, like, okay, that's a crocodile. That's a mammal. All of these are mammals. But, like, what does that what is that? What does that? What kind of animal is that? Well, we don't really know. It's actually um, a Uintathir. But what I'm getting at is, even though these are like, if you squint, they look familiar. This life is still old life. These are old mammals. This is the old guard of mammals. We haven't got to our rhinos, horses, those things yet. A bunch of weird stuff. Actually, the precursors to all of those we got going. So here's another one. This is from about 38 to 39, so a little bit closer. These are these big brontotheres back here. We have these big, they're called uh, hell pigs. They're like giant warthogs. They probably stand about as high as me. Um, these are early horses. So we do start to get them early horses, but they don't look like horses. Some other uh, odd-toed ungulates back here, so like rhinos and tapers, those types of things. But here's kind of the greatest hits of the Paleogene. One thing that shows up almost directly after the asteroid impact is Titanoboa. This is the largest shark that has ever, or shark, snake, snake that has ever lived. So here's a city bus, uh, and here's the snake. So it was about 40 feet long. It lived in South America. Basically just take a green anaconda and make it 40 feet long, and that's, that's basically what you got here. But this is a modern anaconda vertebra probably from an individual upwards of 15 feet long. And there's the same bone from Titanoboa. This was a very big creature. But it was still really warm at the end of the Cretaceous. It was still pretty hot. So it was living in these very, very warm environments without any other big terrestrial animals. Actually, I think there was a crocodile that got really big, and there were some turtles that got really big at this point in time. But again, this stuff is the stuff that's filling those large land animal niches, right? So the, all the dinosaurs are gone, so you got a whole bunch of open niches. So snakes took over for a while. We also get Hyracotherium. This is the oldest horse, and it's got a whole bunch of toes. So horses today walk on their middle toe, only one, so they're constantly flipping you off all the time, every day. But back in the late Eocene, they had four toes up front and three toes in the back. And they were about the size of a house cat. How adorable would that be? We also get Paraceratherium. This is the largest mammal that's ever lived, the well, tallest mammal. There was a Paleoloxodon, a type of elephant that gets really close to this size too. But we think the Paraceratherium could reach a little higher up. It was actually wiped out by the um, invasion of elephants in Asia. So these things were high treetop browsers, 
and elephants like to push trees over. They do not go together well. We also get the entire evolution of whales that happens in the Paleogene. So they go from these little terrestrial Indohyus-like creatures to these kind of ter uh, transition aquatic, semi-aquatic creatures all the way down to fully aquatic and into our modern um, whales. But you can see uh, Dora, Drordon, Dr Dr anyways, this guy here shows up about 40 million years ago. So the entire evolution of whales takes place in the Paleogene. We also get Purgatorius, this cutie right here. We think that this is a stem mammal, a plesiodaptiform, that's what we call him. And so this guy is like a little closer to the base of the mammal family tree. So very close to our, um, our primate lineage. Uh, so this is the base of the primate family tree here, so excuse me. And we find their fossils in Montana. So Montana used to have early primates. Here's the neogene, again, I think at this point in the Neogene, there's still some weird stuff, but you're like, okay, that looks like a llama. Right, it is, it's an early camel. Um, this is a type of rhino. This is the first rhino that had horns, actually. This is another one of those big uh, kind of hell pig things, and there's some cats, dog looking stuff over here. So we're starting to get a little bit more familiar. In the uh, later uh, Miocene, Pliocene time, uh, we start to get real camels, we start to get real horses. We get these weird things called ambelodons that uh, had four tusks. So they had two of the normal tusk and then two lower tusk. This is Teleoceros. This is a big fat rhino. Uh, it had a like, big, I call it a pot-bellied rhino. <laughs> Some people call it a short-legged rhino, but I think pot-belly is cuter. Uh, but literally, it, it had short legs and a big round pot-belly. Um, this is actually Idaho three and a half million years ago. So here is Hagerman's horse. Here's a little ground sloth that works its way up from North, uh, South America. Uh, we got some pickeries, saber-toothed cat. Nope, I don't see any grizzlies in there. Nope. Um, there were bears. No grizzlies yet at three and a half million, but there were bears. Nope, they um, have not evolved yet. They're not here yet. They're not here yet. What was their ancestor? Bear-like creatures, but I don't remember where and when they show up. But 3.5 million, there's not a true like grizzly bear yet. We have the bear family is, is well and alive at this point in time, but not a true grizzly bear yet. Grizzly bears are actually very, very recent evolution. So in the Neogene, here's two of the greatest hits of the Neogene. Megalodon. So a lot of people think that the largest shark ever probably ate dinosaurs and lived in the Mesozoic. It did not. It lived about 23 to about 3 million years ago, and it ate pygmy whales, small whales. That's what it was eating. And again, with megalodon, it's a cartilaginous fish. We don't have the whole body. We only have the teeth and the mouth, basically. So we have to extrapolate how big we think in these individuals would have been. So each one of these is a different type of estimate based on the same data, basically. So they go from scarily large to absolutely terrifyingly huge. Here is a human for scale. Here's our largest great whites. So this is the largest female, and here's just a normal size, regular large female. And then here's some whale sharks down here. So the largest estimate of a megalodon gets up to the largest size of a whale shark today. That would be a very large fish, very large shark. The other thing that happens towards the end of the Neogene, about three million years ago, is North and South America came together. This whole time I've been talking, North and South America did not touch. South America was totally an island continent. And then about three million years ago, uplift, volcanic uplift, lifted up Central America, the Yucatan Peninsula, and then all of a sudden, for the first time ever, animals were able to freely cross into each continent. So our camels went south, and they actually go extinct in North America, but they're still down with like llamas and guanacos and things like that in South America. Our dogs, the canid family, go south and goes crazy. In three million years, they became, South America became the most diverse canid place in the world. There's more canid species in South America than anywhere else in the world. And they came there three million years ago from North America. Horses went south, died out here in North America. They actually go east 
also into Asia. Our bear family, the pig family, all those go down. But we get anteaters, we get porcupines, we get possums, we get these great things called glyptodonts. They don't go very far up north, but they get there. And we also get the sloth family. Now sloths are actually really good swimmers and they popped over a little earlier um, than the rest of the crew. Uh, but we still get a lot of them that come up through this great American biotic interchange. Humans were not Boom! Humans! You're a step ahead of me this whole talk. Whole talk. So here we are at human evolution, and it starts about at the Pliocene. So about six million years ago, we get what we think of as our oldest ancestor, and that's Sahela Anthropus, this guy. And if we look at this, I'm very proud of this graphic, by the way. So this little branch over here is the Ardipithecus group. So Ardipithecus ramidus, Sahela anthropus, Aurora tugenensis, Ardipithecus. That's our group down here. These were occasional upright walkers. They had the ability to do it, but they probably only did it on occasion. Uh, no tools yet. Still a really small brain cavity, uh, but we're getting the uprightness finally. About six million years, there was a walk. If we move up over to this other branch into the Australopithecus group, we get probably the most famous of them all. Australopithecus are Africanus, that's Lucy. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of other ones. Or Africanus, Afarensis, this one. Australopithecus, Afarensis, this is Lucy, that is not Lucy. Um, and then a couple of other ones. So at this point in time, about four to two, three-ish million years ago, some things are changing. We're mostly upright walkers, but we're not 100% sure if we're out of the trees yet. So we might kind of act like chimpanzees, where we hang out on the ground all day, eat foods, socialize, do that number. But we're still pretty weaponless at this time. So it's probably safer to sleep and nest in trees. So we think that these individuals might hang out during the day on the ground, but then still spend a lot of time in the tree for safety. We also get the first stone tools. So somebody in that group is making tools. You're missing one category on the left chart, left plane, and that's if you have past, today, and the future. The seven billion people that we have are destroying the environment for them. Oh. That's for another talk another day. I'm not going into the future right now. So I just want to get you guys out of here at nine. I mean, this has gone on way longer than I thought. <laughs> so uh, Paranthropus are some side branch cousins of ours. Uh, they had really big teeth, really big jaws, probably eating really tough foods. And then boom, here's our family group. And what's really great about this family group is that we all interbred. <laughs> uh, so everybody was copulating with everybody. And it makes uh, figuring out our genetics a nightmare because we still have a lot of Neanderthal like I do. I have a lot of Neanderthal variants in my body. If you live in Southeast Asia, you actually have a whole bunch of uh, Homo floresiensis DNA in your body because Homo sapien, none of these people looked that different than us, undoubtedly. All right, very quickly, the Ice Age. It happened, if you wanna know more, check out my talk on the Ice Age. It's on MCAT, you can find it on YouTube. Here's some animals of the Ice Age. I'm sure we're all familiar. Humans were not the cause of the extinction of the Ice Age megafauna. It was climate change. If we look at this graph, it shows you where the animals, this is closer to present, this is far away. Um, and all of these big extinction events happen in interglacial periods, in warming times. This is the last glacial maximum. Nothing went extinct, really. Each one of these white bars is a cool time, each one of the tan bars is a warm time. So there's these fluctuations, and most of the extinction events that we see happen in the warm periods. Also, here's when Homo sapiens enter Europe. There's not some massive extinction event that happens all of a sudden when we arrive. Did humans obviously add another stressor to the environment? Sure, sure we did. But we are not the cause of all of the large megafauna at the end of the Pleistocene.
we did not cause all of their extinctions. It was definitely the warming climate that threw them off. And with that, I'm done. Uh, here's my book. Uh, if you want to read more about the history of life on Earth, check it out. And if you have any other questions, please email me. <laughs> yes. We're going to forego questions, yes. Uh, May 19th, the program is Missoula's Chinatown, and our speaker is Maria. Please come and talk to us on May 19th.